Hi fellow woodworkers. This video series is going to document how I created this ceremonial wine box. Uh, I'm going to show you how I made the half blind and full blind dovetails. I'm also going to show how the molding was carved into the side of the box using hand planes. Uh, the box was constructed from a cherry flitch. You can see the remainder of the flitch. The box is sitting on it right there. I'm also going to show how to install a half mortised lock and mortised hinges that you can see right there. In the first installment of the series, I'm going to be talking about how to visualize your project on the lumber in the yard so you can make sure you get the correct wood the first time. We'll also discuss laying out the project on the flitch and milling the pieces, so stick around. So my next project is going to be a wine box for a wine box ceremony. It's a type of uni unity ceremony for a wedding that's becoming more popular these days, where the bride and the groom each write a love letter to each other, neither one of them reads it. They insert, a box, uh, they insert a bottle of wine into the box with the two love letters, and uh, in one year, five years, or ten years, whatever they decide on, they open it. Uh, they're going to nail it shut during the ceremony, and it's sort of a thing that you only open if uh, you really have a trying time in your marriage and you need to read the letters to rejuvenate your love, or uh, you wait until your anniversary, or your fifth anniversary, uh, and then open the box and see what you wrote about each other before you were married. And then part of the tradition is to put a new bottle in the box uh, and new two new two new letters, which will read in the next interval, be it five years, ten years, whatever. This is the flitch of cherry I plan to use. Uh, I got it from uh, Willard's in uh, Lawrence, New Jersey, and uh, they deal with a lot of. Um, uh, they have a, a company that's a sister to them called Save a Tree, and uh, they collect a lot of fallen timber from storms, and um, then they re they mill them and sell them to you as flitches like this. And uh, this one was a particularly good deal because you can see in this section right here, there's a bit of a rough spot. I only need part of it for the box and the grain was so nice. This is near the base of the tree, down over on this side here. So the grain comes out in a nice radial area like that. And I plan on using that for the lid. And then I'll use uh, the transitional color here from sapwood to heartwood. I'll be using that um, for the sides of the box. Mm. This is the design I'm going to be going for. This is looking at it from one side. The box will be roughly five and a quarter by five and a quarter um, by 14 inches long, plus the lid for you know a couple, an added three quarters of an inch thick. I plan on milling molding out of this uh, with hand planes, plowing it out, and then smoothing it out, and then uh, using uh, using a couple hollows to get those fillets there. You see, and I guess we'll see how it goes. All right. So first things first, you want to find out there's a lot of waning on the edge here where the bark was and it appears that it's really very crooked but it's actually fairly straight and I have my yellow straight edge over here. So what you want to do is find the two parts that are inmost on the board. and line it up with the portions of the board that you definitely want to keep so you're not cutting in too far to the base or too far down there depending on which side you're looking to reference. I think I'll line it up along this, this spot here and you see you can get an idea of how the grain is going to look. So yeah, I'll mark it just like that. Yeah, that looks good. And just take the pencil. Okay, so I've marked off roughly where I'm going to be planing, planing to. So an average single bottle wine box is 4x4x13 four by four by inches. Uh, this box is going to be a little bit bigger in all dimensions because the wood is thicker and I want a little space for the, uh, for the love letters to go so that I don't, you know, they're not forced to cram them or jam them or bend them, whatever. They can put them down straight. So I'm looking for 5 inches clear on the inside. Because I want this to look as though the same board is wrapping around the outside, with the exception of one corner, because uh, unfortunately the grain pattern does change a bit as you go up here. So there's one corner, I'll make it a back corner, that appears that's going to be out of alignment. But the rest of them, the sapwood to heartwood transition, is fairly linear across. So I'm going to mark roughly from here, and mark out my sections. And here I take measuring twice, cutting once to a whole new level, so I just tried to speed up this part of the layout, uh, just so, because it's not worth seeing me go back and forth a million times. Okay, so now I'm going to cut this side and plane it down to this line. I have a straight reference line to measure the depth of my panel, and then I'll rip across. 
To perform the rip along the length of the board so I can get my reference edge, I have heavily marked and then started ripping down using you know, my favorite rip saw, whichever one you want to use. This is a uh, Distin D115 victory saw. Um, as far as TPI, I believe it's 8. Yeah, 8 TPI. Um, needs a little bit of sharpening. By going through this cherry, it does a pretty good job. So, something I like to do when I'm not working on a great bench is to clamp down at least two spots since I don't have a face vise big enough for a board like this. And uh, if the bench is light, or even if it's not, if you have a saw horse, it's easier. But oftentimes I like to, you know, get one leg, at least one knee on here to keep the board from rocking back and forth this way. And uh, then <clears throat> using your inner thigh to keep the board from twisting the other way, you know, you press against this way. And that way you can get your shoulder nice and centered over where your cut's going to go. And you can just guide it down the curve. Like that. So now I've gotten about as far as I'm going to get on this board uh, with, with how it's currently mounted. So I'm just going to shift it up the table and then continue to cut down to my marker line here. And try to uh, let the cut overlap the edge of the table just a little bit, less than half an inch. And that way, <clears throat> definitely keep the, the center of my cut uh, when I'm pushing down on the wood as close to the table as I can so I'm not trying to rock the table back and forth. I always like to use a block in between the wood and my clamps so that I don't dent it no matter what kind of feet are on this, even though these are soft, rubbery type feet. They tend to leave a mark almost no matter what you do, so you're better off just using a, a block of wood in between. Something soft, this is pine. This is also another piece of pine here. Okay. When you're sitting right over the saw like this and you have it centered between your shoulders, you can definitely use a nice two-hand ripping technique. Some people hold here. Some people, there's a lot of different grips. I have a D8 that has a has an extra finger hole, so you can put your thumb through here and push. I typically just grab here. But being centered over the saw like, like this allows you to use the weight of your body instead of just your arms. So you get a lot of extra force out of your saw without having to tire yourself out too much. You always want to cut at an angle with the saw tilted back or tilted forward. But if you're ripping like the, in the stance that I'm ripping now, you want to tilt it back like this. It's just more natural and it'll keep that from chattering on the edge of the board and you just shift yourself back to maintain an acceptable angle. There we go. Just got to cut the waste off. Plane this flat so we have a reference edge, and then measure the width of the, of the uh, boards to use in the box. And then rip again. After finishing the cut along the length of the board, put a level along the length, a nice straight edge, so I could see how close to straight my cut is for my reference plane. And there's a little bit of a low spot right here. There's a high spot outside where the end of my box is going to be, and there's a high spot outside the other end too. So. The space in between is off by maybe a sixteenth of an inch. So what I'm going to do is mark off, instead of playing this flat now and having to get rid of high spots that I don't need to get rid of because they're not part of the box, uh, I'm going to make a call and mark the width of the board uh, for the side of the box off of the low spot, which is roughly there. And I'll rip five and three quarters down the length here. And then I'll have my board that I can cut into segments for the length of the box. Now, for the lid of the box, which is going to be this end grain here, and I'll probably use a parallel piece that's parallel to this grain and not this grain for the bottom. It'll probably be out of this area here. Um, so in order to get the cut that I'm looking for, I'll end up cutting the lid off first. There's a bit of a change of plans, and that's just because of where the high spots ended up on the end of the board here. Um, there's never any sense <laughs> spending time uh, machining or planing stuff down that, that isn't going to help you. So, it's time to get the lid marked out, make sure I have it marked out correctly, and take it off. Alright, so I've marked out, using pencil, uh, where my lid is going to be for the box, and now I'm going to mark out with the utility knife 
uh, the end of the board that I'm going to cut off first. And uh, I'm using a utility knife because I can get nice and deep quickly. It only takes a few passes and it gets through tricky grain like the, the end of this board here. And I can use that to create um, the cut that I'm going to then pair to with a chisel for my knife wall. And uh, when I'm pairing for a knife wall, I grab the widest straight edge chisel I have, like this one right here. And uh, I push against it from the waist side of the cut and uh, just push up to the cut and remove a nice, uh, a nice amount of material. So I just pair away at this line all the way across back and forth. And notice when I'm using the chisel to push into the knife wall, I'm just using my hands. Uh, I rarely grab the mallet. If I need to push a little bit harder, I'll just uh, use the, the the heel of my palm to give a little heel strike uh, right, right at the end of the chisel there and give me a little extra force I need to get through the wood grain. And the reason you want to use the palm of your hand or a smaller mallet instead of a heavier mallet when you're striking is because you don't want to jump across your knife edge cut that you've made there and uh, chip wood off the other side. It's amazing how when you take a big wide chisel like that you can chip out a large section of wood on the other side of that because now you're basically paring and you're getting right in between the grain. What you use a knife wall for is to guide something and in this case I'm going to be using it to guide a saw and uh, the saw I'm using has a has a rigid back and because it doesn't flex as easily it doesn't it actually my arm can uh, misdirect the saw and cause it to wave back and forth um, and that'll translate through the wood, whereas a, a soft, flexible saw, like the distant I was using earlier, um, will more or less track straight in the wood, irrespective of my, uh, my subtle arm imperfections. Yeah, so that piece of wood fell off, not because it just broke as it was being sawed, but because there was a hairline fracture in the piece of wood. I did continue sawing through that, but that was rather alarming, uh, because it was such a fine crack. Unexpected. So now I need to find out how far that crack goes back. It's something that can be fixed with wood glue and a putty knife. And it's such a hairline crack. I thought it was a pencil mark. It's such a fine crack. Can't even see it in the end grain. Wood glue and a putty knife should do it. So now all that's left to remove the lid is to make a parallel cut a little further up the board, and I've marked that out. I'm going to be using a, a different uh, saw this time. I'm using a, a victory saw again, but this is a crosscut victory saw. And because the grain here is a little more straight ahead, I'm not so concerned about the finish of the cut, so I'm more comfortable using a larger tooth saw. Also, not having to cut a knife wall in this instance does save me a decent amount of time. Join me next time, I'll be showing how the moldings will be carved into the sides of the box. If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions, please leave them in the comments section below and I'll respond to them as soon as possible. If you like what you're seeing and want to see more, please subscribe. Thanks and happy woodworking.